Welcome to the OpenChain Mini Summit for onboarding. This meeting is covered by the Linux Foundation Antitrust Policy Notice, as are all of the meetings by Linux Foundation projects. You can find the full antitrust policy on our website. And of course, if you're from a Linux Foundation member company, you can talk to our council, Andy Updegrove. We have a pretty busy agenda today, and I'll hand over to Nathan almost immediately to get rolling on that. Uh, the first question is, how should we market OpenChain? The next, uh, how do we have entry to our website and community that works best for people? Uh, then we continue on to the topic of how do we make sure that people entering our community regionally and globally have a great welcome? And of course, then something related to a strategic matter, how should the onboarding committee of the project work? Now, if you're wondering what I mean by onboarding committee, uh, we've run everything through an onboarding work group for quite a few years, but our project charter actually has a provision for a formal onboarding committee, and it seems timely to get that rolling. That will tie into other work groups, such as education, whereby the onboarding committee will take formal votes to provide strategy to guide other work groups. Anyway, enough of me talking. I'm going to hand over to Nathan, uh, to run the show. And Nathan, naturally, I'm here to support in all areas. Just so you know, uh, Nathan, you're currently muted. And there we go. Thank you, Shane. Uh, uh, good day, everyone, uh, whatever time of day it is for you. And it's uh, great to have you on this call. So, so thank you for joining this, this first uh, onboarding uh, mini summit. I think we're going to have a great discussion. Uh, this, to me, is a particularly important area. Um, I think, especially when this this project started, you know, I think we have a unique problem in, you know, this particular space we operate because, you know, we're all in very much a niche area of of law and, and business practice. Um, you know, open source is not something that's you know, widely commonly understood. Um, you know, among if, you know, if you're in a large company, you know, you're usually one of the you know, few people who will, you know, have a, a good deal of understanding about this topic. And sometimes it's easy to communicate this among, you know, other fellow open source practitioners. Um, but sometimes it's, it's difficult to explain your job to to others, say in the elevator. You know, to any great depth. And so, you know, as we found, we, we pulled this project together. It was easy for us to talk together as a community, but maybe a little harder to explain, you know, the goals and what we're trying to do to others outside of it. Um, and so we started a project um, specifically aimed at, at this, you know, making sure that, you know, our outward facing uh, content, um, you know, landed with people outside was accessible. And so that, that turned into, you know, you know, smart projects among certain people to, to kind of organize content or, or write things in, in ways that are easily, you know, understandable and translatable to, to various audiences. But I think we're at a point right now where, you know, we need a real big push right now to, to move to the next level here. Um, you know, I think that the goal right now, we're an established, a strong established standard. We have a strong community, um, but we want to become, you know, predominant. We want to be everywhere. Um, you know, we want to be accessible to, to everyone. And we want to broaden our, our reach into other industries that, that we haven't reached before. And so, um, so we're gonna need a, a strong team to support this effort. So that said, that's my introduction. Um, and we want to begin this with a discussion about you know, the four points that Shane has here. And so this is intended to be a discussion. Um, we're intending that you know, everyone here is, is able to um, make input. Um, we would hope that there are things you know, among these questions that you'll be excited to join in and, and take leadership and ownership of as well. And so if there's, if there's things in here that you support, we wanna know that. If there's things you're interested in um, participating in, uh, we'd love to know that too. 
All right, so that said, let's, let's begin with the first question. Um, the first question here is how should we market open chain? How should we, um, you know, and that's a very broad question. Uh, and I think we, you know, breaking that up, we can talk about how do we, you know, not only, you know, in our website and how we present our content, uh, because there's there's an awful lot there. Um, you know, how can we reach um, new communities? Uh, you know, and broadly, so this is kind of the op open overall question um, that we want to add some definition to. So I, I, in talking with Shane, I have a few suggestions we can throw out. Maybe that'll get the conversation started. Um, I think initially, a couple of the questions are, how can we take people from, you know, draw people to the community? Um, but then not only that, how do we draw people into participation? And so uh, there's people who have, um, you know, many companies who have engaged with conformance, but not yet engaged in the community, engaged in, in joining one of our calls. Um, so we know the website is going to be an important facet for that. Um, so perhaps I can open it with with that topic, and if there or if there's other topics that are of more immediate interest, I can I can see if there's any other uh, input that people have. And perhaps just for very quick reference uh, for people, we have done some updates to the website. Uh, so the website has been. Uh, improved recently to try to make discovery easier. For instance, the top menu is much faster to get you to the certification, uh, information about platinum members, leadership, conformant orgs, and how to jump in, you know, our community interviews, webinars, um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're still working on the website. We have a lot more to do, of course. <laughs> we probably want to move the discoverability for participation onto the front page. But uh, it's it's just worth noting that we we have got things underway and I've just posted the link in the chat. I just, just wanted to put that in the in the mix there, Nathan. And for people too, yes, two ideas in particular, when Shane mentioned one is, is you know, we wanna bring forward some of the communities that are industry specific. Uh, so, you know, it's easier for people to find. Uh, we think that one way that it might be easiest for people to engage as if there's community specific to their industry. Uh, that might be the easiest on-ramp for, for new folks to, to you know, begin joining the community and become active members. Um, the, other, the other piece, you know, we'd like some suggestions on is there's an awful lot of content here. Um, and you know, Shane, I don't know if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind sharing the, the screen again on the website. Um, but there's an awful lot of content here. There's a lot of blog posts. There's a lot of material that's in our GitHub site, a lot of resources and materials. Um, and if you have suggestions about what's the best way to make that accessible, um, you know, we'd love to hear that as well. Um, and that may guide how you know, this work develops. So can I ask, is there any comments on the website? Uh, can anyone hear me? I... <laughs> uh, we can hear you, yes. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Great. So, okay. Andrew. Um, yeah, it looks like um, the, the chat is disabled at the moment. Um, it is from my end anyway, so I don't know if people are trying to put things in chat and are, are, are unable to do that. Okay, I'm going to check if I can change those permissions. Uh, we, currently, uh, everything seems to be going through the Q&A. Okay, it's uh, currently not letting me change that permission immediately, but I will keep working on that. <laughs> so <laughs> bear with me. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, I, 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 sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna, gonna say, I mean, I, I don't have any particular comments about the website other than that, I, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's great. Um, but I was thinking more in terms of taking a step back and thinking from my experience, um, you know, what has driven um, my clients into the open chain family and it seems that by I mean by far the most um, powerful driver is uh, when I'm working with a supplier of software 
and one of their customers or potential customers says, oh, by the way, uh, we need you to either look into or actually be open chain compliant. Um, and that e even if the customer, uh, my client that I'm talking to is, is aware of open chain and there tends to be a sort of educative process that they need to go to to get there. Um, it, um, um, it, 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 it tends to be something that um, is on a sort of you know, medium track as far as urgency is concerned. So I, I've, I've had clients that I've been working with consistently um, you know, for over two years now who are um, working um, in the direction of, of compliance. Um, but uh, they don't see it um, as, um, you know, it, it, it's it's not something that they see as, as a particular major priority at the moment because they've always got other things that they need to be getting getting on with. Um, so we'll be doing things like uh, we'll be delivering training for them, which is all designed to fit into an open chain framework. We'll be providing compliance information about specific products, which again is um, all designed to, to fit into an open chain framework. And we'll be building a policy for them, which is tends to be done piecemeal, but with an overall view to become open chain compliant but getting them over the line tends to be the, the tricky thing up until the point at which one of their customers or potential customers says um, we need open chain compliance and that changes the whole thing significantly and that's the point at which they say right we need to fast track this now this is this has happened a couple of times um, and um, you know one very notably we're working with a client who supplies a lot of software into the automotive field um, and um, one of their um, customers is is now um, uh, uh, preferring suppliers uh, who are open chain compliant um, and it's now become um, you know a management uh, priority to make sure that open chain compliance happens so I just the rest of the conversation that we have I think it would be just useful to sort of bear that in mind and I, I suspect that I'm you know not the only person that's had that experience yeah Andrew thank you sorry go ahead thank you. go ahead Shane Oh, I just wanted to thank Andrew and just jump in really quickly to say chat works now. So over to you, Nathan. Okay, all right. Oh, that's great. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And I, I assume that's, you know, one of the drivers we were hoping to see is the context of where, you know, maybe product companies are able to use open chain to, you know, you know set the a ground for discussion and, and, and negotiations. Um, or, or work within their supply chain to start to unify, you know, the practices within it. Um, so I, I take it some of this context happened in the in the terms of a let's say a deal. Is that right, or a, a negotiation? Um, yeah, not necessarily. Um, I mean, it, it is it is where where the um, you know I have clients that have identified a need for compliance, um, but they're not entirely sure um, you know why, other than the fact that they're feeling a bit uncomfortable that what they're doing may or may or may not be compliant, and they they want some idea of what their risk profile is. Um, as soon as it turns into the context of a potential deal, then that that is the point at which you know the the urgency level increases significantly. Um, and I think uh, yeah, it, it feels that we're close to, um, you know, uh, to, 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 um, to say the unavoidable pun, a, clo a chain reaction here, um, in that, um, uh, you know, the more, the more um, customers are demanding open chain compliance, uh, the more suppliers need to be compliant, uh, the more general awareness that there is. Um, and I feel that in certain sectors, we're on, on the cusp of that happening at the moment, um, you know, automotive being one of them. Um, where uh, there is uh, general uh, general awareness is, is 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 actually pretty high at the moment, but um, in other sectors, um, I am spending a lot of time educating people about saying, you know, by the way, that they know that they want a particular product to be compliant because that's that's something that they're shipping, um, and um, then I explain to them, well, you know, there is an easier way to demonstrate um, compliance. Um, and that is basically to say, you know, we are compliant um, with the open chain specification, or we have certification, or, or you know, whichever route um, to demonstrating that they they want to follow. Um, so there's a sort of there's a sort of um, a, a sort of medium track approach, uh, which is where most of my clients are at the moment, and this is where they they say to me, we have a particular product we're about to ship, and we want to make sure that um, you know we we have ensured compliance. So I say, okay, we can do a compliance job on that particular product, uh, but you do realise there's an easier way. Um, uh, to, rather than asking us to analyze everything to the nth degree going forward is that you know you you institute um, appropriate practices and procedures internally and then you document those 
uh, and then um, you have to do a number of other things, but you'll find your open chain compliant and that makes the whole process much, much more straightforward uh, as opposed to the fast track approach, which, which is the one that says, you know, there's a deal and we need to get compliant for the deal. Yeah. Uh, so Andrew, maybe a question to you then is, um, is there like a marketing effort uh, that could help serve this, this kind of dynamic? Um, perhaps say, you know, like a negotiating negotiation guidebook or or, or playbook, yeah. um, perhaps. I mean, I guess what, what, what I, I would like to see, um, if possible, um, is that, um, you know, obviously we, we, we have um, of the, the, the um, uh, founder members and conformant members, we have some very large prominent organizations. Uh, the more public statements that we can get from them um, that say, you know, uh, and, and, and a lot of, I mean, admittedly several of them have said this already, um, that, um, you know, we will uh, prefer software suppliers um, who can demonstrate open chain compliance, um, and ultimately that will become, um, you know, a a, a, um, a a blocking criterion as to whether we will actually select a particular supplier or not. I think that that is the point at which it, um, you know, would become very very powerful. And I, you know, I know, I mean, Scania, for example, is one organisation that has, that has publicly said this, and I think there are a couple of other ones. But that that's a message that um, you know I would like to see ideally um, much more uh, strongly. Um, promoted. Okay, that's a uh, great feedback. Thank you. And uh, so I'm taking note of that. And I think out of this, I would love to get a list of, of concrete actions, such as what you just mentioned here. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, if we can collect statements such as that or encourage statements such as that, um, you know, that will help drive this community forward. Yeah, so, I mean, even something like, a, you know, a, I mean, something that's reasonably lightweight um, for, um, you know, prominent companies is to see if they can complete a survey. And if it says, it says some, something along the lines of, you know, questions, uh, do you require open chain conformance? Do you prefer open um, suppliers who are open chain um, conformant? Um, you know, do you not really care about open chain conformance or something? Then we get some results back. And then if it says something like, um, you know, 89% um, uh, of members say that they um, they currently um, prefer open chain conformant organizations and sort of 97% of them say that uh, they will be requiring it within the next two years or something along those lines. You know, that's the sort of thing that, that you can use as part of a press release, which will which will sort of grab headlines and, and make people start thinking about this seriously, because, you know, people who, who want to work with the prominent partner members and uh, that, 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 that we have um, and uh, want to be able to supply software to them, um, you know, if they, they, they see, well, OK, if we want, want to be able to supply this software, one of the things that we must do is to become open chain conformant. That, that's going to be a hell of a driver. Um, so that I think I think maybe is another sort of concrete um, suggestion is actually putting together a, a sort of you know relatively lightweight survey. It only needs to have a couple of questions, um, and um, you know, but seeing if, if we can um, you know persuade the members um, and especially you know the, the top tier members um, to to answer that. Yes, thank you. That's a, a great idea. Um, I think. Uh... Let's see, I have that noted here. And, and I'm getting a couple comments as well. Um, so Mary had mentioned uh, cross-promotion as well. Short description. Uh, so cross-promotion with other standards groups, um, you know, with, with statements about how they, they promote the standard. And then a cross promo or promotion to service based orders as well. Um, uh, so, it, yeah. And how about this? And then, Andrew, I don't, I don't want to cut off the discussion on yours before. If you had any further thoughts um, um, before we move to the the next topic, is there? Um, uh, perhaps can I can I pick on you once more, Andrew, and, and we'll close that topic. Um, is there anyone in particular we could market that effort toward, or is there is there like you know within a large company, say you know, is it the procurement organization? Is there certain organizations that have to make this kind of decision about um, preferred suppliers? 
Yeah, that's that's a good question, um, and I suspect it's one of those things that sort of probably varies from um, from organisation uh, to organisation. Um, I mean, I guess you know ultimately, um, I mean, what I'm focusing on is um, probably the, uh, the, the the sort of medium sized um, suppliers um, who are thinking. You know what can we best do to make sure that we're able to play in the marketplace um, that uh, where, where our customers are going to be um, and then you know look look at the top tier um, open chain um, partner companies and members um, and um, you know in many cases um, you know it, it is it is it is um, uh, going to be sales and marketing director CEOs um, who are thinking what, what what can we best do to maximise our chances and also to differentiate ourselves from our competitors as well? And this is this is a, a line that I, I sort of frequently um, frequently use. Um, you know, when I'm talking to customers that are looking looking for um, compliance and saying, well, you know, what one 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 thing about open chain compliance is that um, you know it really does help you to um, differentiate yourself from your customers. Um, uh, sorry, from your competitors. Uh, but um, so combination of that and also the fact that it may ultimately, um, you know, become an, an absolute requirement um, for, for for procurement processes, I, th I think is, is a sort of pretty powerful message. So the question is how are people going to find out about this? Um, it's, um, I mean, cer certainly if sort of a press campaign, I mean, if we do something like a survey that, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident that will um, generate some pretty interesting to statistics um, in in terms of um, you know what the, the top tier um, customers um, are going to be looking for, um, and uh, so then we've got um, you know any any number of um, uh, you know publications. Um, I mean, you know, in the UK, um, there's the Register, Computer, Computer Weekly, um, Tech Market View, you know, um, but we can all think of other publications worldwide that might be interested um, in, uh, in 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 publishing something like that. So I think it's it's um, you know, it would be a really good sort of springboard for for marketing activity, um, and um, and then you know it, it also means that um, when we as partners are talking to um, our potential customers then you know it'd be really extremely useful material to uh, uh, to rely on um and uh, to say you know we, we, this 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 is this is this is serious stuff you know if you want to be um, selling your software um you know into, into the likes of um, you know sort of, uh, qualcomm or <laughs> or uh, or toyota or bmw or you know whoever it happens to be um then you're going to have to make sure that this is something that um that, that you have in hand I, Andrew, I think you're making a great point. I think, uh, yeah. So, so creating the the data that people will see that, um, you know, leadership of suppliers, you know, yep. are, are seeing that their their target market, right, is is wanting this. Um, I think yes. that, yeah. Okay. I, uh, point well taken there. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, and I have that in the notes here. So, if you don't mind, let's let's. I think Mary's raising some good points here in the chat, and then we'll move on to Bala Krishnan's. Uh, but Shane, would you mind maybe taking the first pass of Mary's question? Uh, what are we doing sure. across promotion with other organizations? Sure. Um, so we have been talking with and collaborating with organizations like OSADL, uh, but as far as I know, we don't have uh, too much cross information on our websites. Instead, we've been doing uh, webinars and so on together. So I think that uh, maybe we can try to arrange that they will increase their exposure uh, to open chain on, on their website. And perhaps we can do something similar for their material. Um, I'll open a discussion, of course, with um, OSI. Uh, and we are doing a lot of work with projects like To Do Group, uh, where we are collaborating on what they're doing with the OSPO scene. We're doing collaboration with uh, SPDX. And of course, we're collaborating with Open Source Security Foundation as well. So we, we do have some stuff underway, uh, but we can do better. And what would be very useful uh, would be to get a feel for the types of organization that you think might be most mm, impactful on, on your side. So the organizations you're thinking of. So I have, you know, for instance, worked with OSADL. I didn't put too much time into OSI, uh, so I'll work on that now as well. And any other orgs would be fantastic. 
to be flagged. Yeah, so, so Mary, I, I hope that addresses your, your question directly. Um, if, if you or anyone else has any other orgs, um, you know, you want to point our community at, um, yeah, please, please let us know. I, I, I suppose maybe one um, extension of, of Mary's idea here is that maybe we would have a cross promotion area prominent on our website or our materials somewhere as well. Um, you know, I, you know, these things tend to go uh, re reciprocally, right? If, if we promote, we, we want people to promote us, uh, we should promote others as well. So, so ASPO zone, uh, Mary's pointing to as well. Noted. That's cool. And um, yeah. Yeah. On and it. then, oh, sorry, sorry, Shane, go ahead. No, I was just saying on it. <laughs> okay. You know, and I think what we'll do is, is as we take these issues, I'll list them in a, in a document here so that we can continue to take in feedback for, for each of these each of these areas here. Um, and we'll put the question to the broader community as well. Uh, so thank you, um, you know, Andrew and Mary so far for the issues that we've been raising. I see Balakrishna uh, raised an issue as well. Um, he's noted that the majority of our conformant organizations are product-based and he suggests maybe we need to have more service organizations on board. Um, just before you, you take the, the question, Nathan, I just wanted to note that when it comes to service orgs, um, we generally have a bunch of them in our partner program, uh, like YPRO and so on, um, and PWC, um, as opposed to them being conformant themselves. But it's certainly something to think about. Uh, Nathan, over to you. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, just, just thinking broadly of, of ways we can reach service organizations. Um, you know, and, and I think it, it can be not just, you know, organizations helping us comply. I think that maybe the question Bala Krishna's raising is, is uh, um, you know, organizations say like PwC, right, that, that provides services to others, even, you know, it's, it's core business, right? Um, you know, they may need to be able to implement these practices for their, their customers. Um, you know, they act as suppliers, right? It's, it's, I think, you know, Bob Christian's pointing out right here. Um, and so, they, you know, maybe there's not a discrete identifiable, identifiable product, right? But they're, they're part of the, the you know, higher part of the supply chain going into the product. And if I, that's my interpretation, I believe, of the question. And Bob Krishna, I hope I'm getting that right. So, um, yeah, so, so broadly thinking about, yeah, thank you. Uh, is there ways to reach those organizations? And maybe I'll throw out an idea or two and, and then see if, if other people have suggestions as well. Um, you know, one thing I think works well is, is having material is targeted toward your your situation and so you might be able to read the open chain spec um, but you know in some ways you have to take that general information and then and then apply it yourself to our specific case but if we can shorten that loop if we can say hey you know if we have a you know a, a sheet or or you know, a playbook that says, hey, this is this is open chain for blank industry, open chain for, you know, the services and software services industry. Um, you know, does that seem like that would be a good approach uh, toward that question? Or, or can you suggest, suggest something better? Okay, yeah, I'm getting one, one, uh, yeah, a couple votes for that. Um, you know, from our point of view, it's nice for us to, to invest time in, um, you know, things that people will think are successful. So, so thank you for the uh, thumbs up to those ideas. I can, let's see here. Yeah, so Bala Krishna's question is the best question on how to get on, on board. Uh, you know, I think perhaps a, 
you know, like the, the informational resources we're, we're saying will we'll create the first step, right? Um, you know, create awareness. And then what can we do beyond that? So, and if you'll bear with me, I'm just taking a couple notes here. We have a floor. And I see we're already cooking some other great comments and questions in, yeah. in the chat. <laughs> it's quite busy out there, uh, which is wonderful. Okay, so LF member organizations, I think I'm just going to go back to our earlier point and uh, add that, in, that point in from Mary. Oops. So one thing I'd love to see with LF member orgs um, would be for our community to use their influence in other projects to bring up to their peers the point that uh, you know if you're doing open source you have to be compliant with the licenses and there's an ISO standard from the Linux Foundation for compliance so it would be really useful I think if our well our um, actual demographic that you um, could emphasize to projects that this is uh, something out there. Uh, so I, I do communicate with the LF projects and I do communicate with LF marketing and they do um, some degree of pushing it. But I think the real thing that makes LF uh, internal work is when the community participants are telling their peers, oh, that this is something you, know, you should do. So that would be just my suggestion is something that would be useful not to say that I'm not going to continue pushing <laughs> what we're doing as hard as possible. Yep. So Shane, I think uh, one of the other interesting point is coming in. Martin, he's, he's suggesting raising awareness is one issue, right? Um, and then, but we need to move them from awareness all the way to, to compliance. Yeah, so the license compliance issue is not well understood. Um, it seems like an opportunity for us to bridge that gap. Um, so, I, you know, a while ago we had a, a concept and I think maybe Toyota originally introduced it was, was the path to compliance, right? We, we had a number of steps, I think it was four steps where it began with awareness, right? Then it began to application and creation of, you know, understanding how to apply it to your particular situation. Um, you know, then it grew to conformance and then it went to say engagement, if, if I have the steps correct. Um, but, you know, I, I think awareness is one part of it, but then you're right, what do we do? And I think this goes to our question here is like, um, maybe the third and fourth question, or is, is, is how do we bring people into you know, from awareness into the, into the, uh, and being involved members, right? Or being in um, compliant, uh, you know, compliant and then to active members. And I kind of see those differently, right? It's, we do see a lot of people reach the compliance level, but then don't go to the next step of becoming an active member. Um, yeah, so, you know, ideas, I think initial ideas we might have are things like the, Industry specific work groups, um, you know, easier on ramps toward, you know, getting on a call, becoming active in the, in the community, um, you know, or opportunities to create or calls for content, opportunities to create something where, uh, you know, someone can participate in, say, a case study. Um, so Maybe I'll throw it out there. If, if people have suggestions about how to get people from awareness to their compliance or act, being active in the um, in the community, I think that's what these questions are are driving at. Um, you know, do you feel like those are are good approaches? Having more you know industry specific work groups or opportunities to create content. Um, or other suggestions if you have them. Um, and we'll, we can look to the chat or, or please feel free to jump in as well. So, I, mean, I, I think you're um, very much on the right track there. And I think 
something there's a, I mean, there's a lot of great comments here. I'm just going to pick up the latest one and then we can move backwards. Um, <laughs> Mar Marcel from PWC noted that uh, we could benefit from moving the conversation strongly to trust uh, and, um, and, and then focus on whether the certification provides the risk reduction that people desire. And I think that's on point because our, our fundamental mission is trust in the supply chain. Martin has a question, which I'll just pick up very quickly to answer. How many Linux Foundation members are there? Uh, and the answer is many, many, many. So um, right now, uh, the note on the website suggests that uh, we have 19,000 contributing companies. Uh, and, and that's all types of different places, of course. So you know, some of those companies are doing stuff not particularly related to open source per se, and some of them are in the heart of it. Uh, the amount of companies that are in the open chain ecosystem numbers in the low thousands that we're aware of. Uh, recently, there was a Bitcom survey in Germany, though, which had some interesting numbers. It was, I think, about 821 companies were surveyed, and approximately 20% of the companies with over 1,000 employees were already utilizing open chain. So it, it, it is going out there, but it would be a tremendous accelerator if more LF member companies were talking about it and uh, engaging with it. You know, Shane, can I ask this? Maybe I'll ask a more specific question. Um, you know, I've, I know we've done calls for case studies. You know, is there, is there things like that, like case studies or, or um, you know, uh, maybe even something less, you know, short of that, that, you know, perhaps another type of survey like Andrew suggested where, um, you know, we can get input from people who are considering compliance. Um, you know, or be, have become compliant and we can find out kind of what, what their interests are or what, what good ways to, you know, they would like to engage their community. Um, you know, throwing that idea out there, if there's any, any uploads for that, please let me know. Or if that sounds like uh, something that would be positive. Um, but Marcel has, has commented again. Um, A good comment about scope where clients are asking, you know, how much of a, a supplier company, et cetera, is actually conformant? Because we, we don't uh, list the scope of the programs on, on, the, on the website right now. Uh, so we, for example, some companies um, like Bosch are whole entity conformant and other companies have a more narrowly, most companies have a more narrowly defined program scope. So that optic is not something that we actively promote at this juncture. Maybe it's something that we might need to talk to at least. And so Mary is asking how many members of the open chain community are in the US? It's an interesting question. Um, actually quite a few, but you've touched on an interesting point. So approximately, one third of the companies involved at the higher level, for instance, the board of Open Chain, are North American, and uh, one, you know, about one third, or a little bit more than one third, in Asia, and then also a bunch of European companies, of course. Uh, and we have a lot of active contributors in the Open Chain community from North America, but uptake of the ISO standard has been lower in North America than in Europe and Asia. And, and that's a, an interesting data point. And I was talking with Scan OSS about this. They were talking about how their outreach uh, in North America shows lesser awareness or at least lesser engagement. And it appears two things might be at play. One is that we probably need to promote more heavily uh, cross-pollination between peers. And that's where the increasing collaboration with to-do group is critical. And the second point is that companies in America are often quite far down the, the road in setting in place open source processes. And there seems to be some inertia in considering the switch to the ISO standard from their existing bespoke processes, whereby 
in Asia, we've got some differences where a lot of companies are putting in place the processes for the first time. You know, Shane, that maybe brings to mind, I think one resource I saw along the way was, you know, kind of an architecture diagram that showed kind of where OpenChain fit in the spectrum of other, other orgs, right? Um, you know, we, we don't get into the weeds of the details about how, uh, you know, we're generally tend to say more what, you know, what elements you need put in place, right? Um, you know, we don't tell you how to scan or, or, or if or, or you know, you know what specific things to train people on, right? Um, and so, so some of the other groups do get into more of those kind of details, right? And so, um, you know, I, I, maybe I, if that resource doesn't sound familiar, I can I can dig through some of the past uh, uh, emails, but you know, I don't know if that would be helpful in this kind of you know discussion yeah. with other other standards here to see how these things can interrelate. Um, you know, you, you can use compliance with some of these other standards to, to build a, a compliance, open chain compliant program, right? Um, but if you're unfamiliar with this, you may have to kind of go to these different communities and kind of figure all this stuff out, right? But if you have maybe a guidebook um, about how to get put together the program, you know, and from there we can, you know, direct people to other other standards or other groups um you know that that might be one way to kind of increase the connections we have between those groups a really good point yeah. and now we had a, a, a note from martin a while back um asking can we clone the self-certify app uh to be a set of questions that spits out an assessment of what needs to be done um, and that touches on something I was discussing with our project manager earlier today. Uh, the current web app is quite frankly, quite clunky. So <laughs> we're, we're gonna refactor it and make it um, a little bit less clunky. And uh, fundamentally, it should be no problem to create an assessment of what needs to be done. Uh, so let's, I think, aim to fill that into the updated web app. And I'd like to have that ready in the next couple of months. You know, Shane, I wonder from that question if it's maybe, you know, it, it, I assume the feedback we're looking for is more than just like, oh, you're missing, say, these questions, because you really are answering yes or no on your own, and you can see your no's, right? Um, you know, I, I wonder if there's maybe more of a connection between, you know, here's these questions. Right. If you're answering no to this area of, you know, the, you know, set of questions, then, then here's the type of resources that might help you, or absolutely you know, other orgs, or, or and so so maybe there's a layer of work that, you know, um, the the team can work on in, in that direction. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, just as a side note. Uh, I, I just pulled up the path to conformance and put the link um, into answering that question, which was, do we have a path to conformance? Yes, we do. Uh, just put it in the chat as well. Uh, I'm gonna make sure that's much easier to discover on, on the website as well. Okay, so, and Shane, I'm just taking a couple, uh, a couple notes here from that last issue, so we get that. Excellent. Uh, I mean, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jay. Uh, just at the same kind of discussion as the path to conformance, uh, we have a playbook showing how a hypothetical medium company um, would adopt. And I'm just putting that into the chat right now. And the to-do item for the education work group is to um, build play, playbooks for small and large companies as well. So that discussion is actually underway in just a couple of days. Uh, and I'm just putting the information so you can register for that uh, webinar as well. It will be in two days on Wednesday and Balakrishna, who's on this call as well, will be leading the discussion there. Now, Shane, I think Martin was raising one interesting point is, is perhaps 
you know, do people feel like there's kind of a leap between, you know, the informational content we have and, you know, the, the content that's in the spec, you know, the things that you need, you need to concretely say yes or no to, yeah. um, you know, is, is that a gap that we can help close and that might, you know, lead people toward, um, you know, take them from awareness to, to compliance, you know, in a speedier way. Um, you know, do people feel like that's a big issue or is that something that, you know, is the spec pretty approachable as it is? I'm curious what people think about that. If we don't have comments, I don't know, Shane, if you've heard things about that or, or feedback about that separately. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think Martin just hit it on the head. He said, who wants to read a spec? <laughs> exactly. Um, probably the de facto way we've been dealing with it has been to send people to the self-certification web app to get yes, no's. And uh, as Mary says, you know, we're, we're almost there, but there's more we can do. Uh, so... Yeah, you know, maybe we could take some feedback on on what parts of the spec we need some particular examples for. Perhaps that could be part of our survey, or if, you know, unless anyone, Mary or anyone, has any any you know specific areas here where we're we're falling short. Um, yeah, we'll take a note on that here. So, yep. uh, that sounds really good. Maybe maybe the distance between arriving on our website and getting you know yes no questions here's what I need to do next is too far. Yeah, yeah. So so point well taken, uh, Mark. And Rick. So thank you for that. Um, and then yes yes Mary, we love love feedback if if uh, it comes to your mind um, for Mary or anyone here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yep. You know, Shane, if it's okay, I, I had a couple other questions I had for people, um, you know, just to see if you think this is something valuable. Uh, one idea we toyed around with was, you know, is perhaps a CLE. Uh, you know, the idea here being, you know, are there certain members of organizations, you know, that we can, you know, get a lot of distance from by targeting, right? You know, is it, Corporate counsel, you know, do we target them with, say, a, a continuing legal education class, right? Or is it, you know, procurement folks or, or people in the, you know, certain procurement or, or you know, area that deals with the supply chain? Is there, a, is there a way, right, you know, we can laser target into the supply chain decision makers um, to, Increase awareness or offer you know the tool, tools that we have to, to help solve their problems. Um, you know, with the, the original question when I opened this up with, with Andrew was, you know, was you know, the original way I've been thinking about it is, is more of a company that's dealing with suppliers, is you know, you know, can we offer open chain as, as a solution to create efficiency for for you know, the whole supply chain, right? Is this something we can show people that, hey, you know, you can use this to, to make the conversations easier when you're negotiating with others. Um, you know, I guess what I'm wondering is if people have ideas about, you know, specific types of roles within companies we can target, you know, perhaps there are conferences for those people, perhaps there are, you know, education points that, that we can enter. Um, just as a, a side note, I mean, procurement is the first and most obvious target to try and hit the people who are in the negotiations, preparing the finalized documents, the contracts, the, the pitches. And, you know, a bunch of those people might be well outside of the active open source community, but have to deal with it every day. And, you know, uh, by the same token, Nathan, I think the CL, uh, CLE thing is that is a fascinating idea. It might take us to lawyers who aren't in our general orbit. Yeah, yeah. You know, or, you know, these might even get us to cross into industries that, you know, we have an entry, right? Um, yeah. So, 
and, and goodness knows, you know, collectively, just on this call, we have sufficient networks to reach out into these areas. It's it's more a question of triage and deciding where do we go next. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So please let us know if this is something that should get get. Um, we should send our efforts toward um, versus versus other things that um, you know we also have as options. So, and just to Marcel's point about leaning heavily heavily into trust, um, I, I think that's something that is very important. And OpenChain has been taking steps towards that uh, in in recent times. So, you know, by way of example, um, just to show you our website now is the first thing it says is building trust in the supply chain. So perhaps we need to align more and more of our messaging on the this is selling trust uh, item. And maybe that's something that we can just put more emphasis on. Hmm. Maybe this is something that needs to be illustrated in some way, I wonder. Um, yeah, maybe. Perhaps maybe. This is Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just I was just agreeing. Yeah, like maybe a, a case study or some some sort of way to to concretely show, you know, the risk reduction. Um, you know, some of our usually our case studies tend to focus on a single org, right? Um, right, right. And, and, and that was because at the time that we were focusing on this, it seemed most pertinent to encourage people that, oh, your peers are, are doing this. But now it might be most pertinent to take a, a yeah. slightly different route. Yeah. So Marcel, I think, was suggesting if we, you know, perhaps ask for certain concrete things like s bonds, right? Yep. Um, so we do have reference to s bonds under section 331. So I'm just gonna pull that up right now, yeah. uh, just to help with reference. So here we are. Uh, so um, we ask for a bill of materials under 331. So we do actually ask for that. Uh, but I, I guess maybe we don't sell it hard enough. <laughs> 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 Maybe that's that's something we need to do. Uh, Marcel is just coming up with a um, clarification. Uh, Balakrishna is asking about the survey results. Uh, and just to address that, uh, Balakrishna, the global survey is currently being prepared. I just got the information from Japan, uh, so it should be out in the next week or two. Uh, Marcel has a point that many companies say they are open chain uh, self-certified, but they're not providing an S bomb. <laughs> okay, that's that's actually a very good point. Um, so, you know, any company that is saying they're open chain certified, but doesn't have a process for creating and managing a bill of materials is not meeting the requirements of the SPAC. So I think that that's something that should be flagged to any of those companies that in section 331 is they have to have a process for creating and managing a bill of materials. So it's, it's not optional. And if they're claiming self-certification, but don't have that, uh, it's, it's an issue they'll need to address. Jane, for the survey, is it, is it too late to you know, edit any content at this point or is it, is it? The survey we did is, yeah, it's done. But I think Andrew hit on something really important. Um, the survey we did, I think it ended in May. So we're, we're, we're finished with that one. But Andrew had a great point about you know, an alternative survey approach that might be quite exciting for people. So I would suggest we just do another survey with that. Yeah, that sounds great. And I think we have a number of ideas here um, you know, that we could collect information on. Not only to find out where people are interested in um, you know, new content, but find out where people are stuck at right? in, in, our, in our process. So. And for what's worked for them, right? 
So. Uh, let's see here. Otherwise, Shane, I think the other question I had had, you know, coming into this, is there any other industries we should be targeting uh, specifically? You know, we have some work groups for, for specific things, but is there anything we're missing? That's a really good question. Um, so, uh, Rhea, you're, you're able to talk, by the way, as well, so you're good to go. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thanks for posting the link to the path to conformance. Um, I, I'm going to look into this a little bit more, and I don't know if it's helpful in any way, but just anecdotally, I will say I became acquainted with Open Chain several years ago, and I remember when I read the specification for it, it reminded me of a sock audit. And I had just gotten through several sock audits at, uh, this was about two jobs ago, but at the company I was in, I had just suffered through two sock audits. And so I had a very strong allergic reaction to the specification, even though I could see that a lot of the questions in it were really useful, good questions. The idea of going through another one of those sock type audits was just an anathema to me. And so having this path to conformance, I think this is something that would be really helpful for onboarding. And it's not something I had seen previously, although I'll admit that I haven't delved into the website as deeply as I probably should have. So for that bit of anecdotal insight, you can use that for what it's worth. <laughs> No, that's really good. And I just answered in the Q&A a point you raised that there's so much stuff talking about how to do your supply chain better. It's overwhelming. So, you know, how we have a great value proposition, but how do we make sure that people can see the value proposition, um, understand that it's not going to be a troublesome lift and it's got this long-term advantage too. So it's, hmm, it's, it's definitely a marketing challenge for us. Uh, but I think this, I'm going to look into this path to conformance uh, page, you know, more over the next few weeks here and um, happy to give feedback on my take on it as I go through it. But uh, I'm hopeful that this is a, a way that I can sort of get the process started without having to read another 50 page specification and figure it <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Shane, would you mind? Could you bring that one up? Uh, for a second. Sure. Path to performance. Yeah. Uh, we're pulling it up right now. And Rhea, thank you for that feedback. I think, you know, there's so much content um, that we could highlight, you know, in the website. And it's it's really helpful to know, you know, what what lands and, and what's the most important. So um, I'm just putting the link in the chat so people have it. Uh, this is the path to conformance document. And that's been out a while. Uh, and it's been pretty Pretty useful for open chain, I guess. We should probably lean heavier on it. There's a bit of updating to do in the links there, as you can see. <laughs> but we'll definitely be able to do that. Yeah. We were talking about webinars earlier, and maybe even just going through a webinar that walks through this path to conformance would be something that people would find valuable. Uh, that's that's a really good point. Yeah. 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 Let's do it as our next webinar. Why not? So maybe, maybe this path to conformance um, should just be at the front of the website. I, I think that's a great idea, Shane. So I... Um... Well, I, I mean, I'll action that. So within 24 hours, the path to conformance will be front and center uh, on the landing page of the website. Uh, and, and maybe we can try to tie the narrative of this is key to trust, here's your path um, and outcomes and value, and here's the community to support you. Maybe we can try to do that a, a little bit more explicitly or have, just change our emphasis a bit to try to make it easier for people to get started. Right now we start by explaining what we're up to uh, and a little bit about what the spec is like. And then we jump into things like our training courses, playbooks and so on, but maybe we're jumping too far. Maybe we just need to do trust, this works for you, 
uh, here's how you adopted the path to conformance and so on. J just noodling there. I think one of the things I liked about the path was like if you're if you enter the web page, you can kind of find the content you're looking for, right? Um, depending on where you're at. You know, because we, we do have so much here. It's not all just for people who are just gaining awareness. Some of it's for people who are, you know, people, part of the community or wanting to, to get some in-depth information. Um, and uh, yeah, I think Mary suggested, uh, you know, in, in terms of timing, maybe we need to at least aim one of the times at, at the, you know, US audience. Let's see, bite-sized videos showing. And I think to Martin's point, maybe there's things out of this, this uh, uh, webinar, maybe we can break out bits of it into, into smaller pieces. Um, yeah, uh, so I mean, I guess, you know, we can schedule the webinar this month perhaps and just take a little time to make sure the path to conformance looks good. So you okay. think you could do it in the latter half of this month? I will, yes, I will take that as an, as an action item to update this here, um, Shane, so. Super cool. I'm just gonna move us back to the question slides so people will have them in front yeah, of us. Yeah. yeah, so Mary and Martin, thanks for that. I think, uh, yeah, MedTech, by the way, uh, I, I heard that as an idea. Uh, for for other industries we should we should be targeting. Now I noticed there was a, a comment which we didn't get to, um, which was uh, about you know, maybe we should talk with more third party certifiers. Uh, I just wanted to super quickly show that we already have quite a few third party certifiers active. Uh, so you know companies like PwC and Synopsys, said or Crow provide global certification. Um, China Academy of Sciences, CAICT in China. Bureau Veritas is global too, but this is the Taipei office. So there's a bit of an emphasis there. In fact, Bureau Veritas just announced the largest media company in Asia uh, is third party uh, certified today. So we do have some third party certifiers in play. Uh, the reason we don't have a, a large cluster is because we generally ask any partner to engage with the community and to, to really know open source and to know us before you know, we, we put them into our official partner program. Nathan, I just saw that there was a, a question in the Q&A about how should we market open chain? Suggestion that we should collaborate with organizations who are trusted by clients. Uh, yeah, we, we, we do. Uh, this, this actually relates to the partner thing. Um, so here's our partner program. Uh, these, they're in the geographical locations, but they have global coverage. Uh, so, you know, we've got these law firms in play, uh, quite a few oh. local law firms, as well as some regional. Shane, I think I see Andrew's hand up. Is, uh, do you yep. have a Yeah, sure. Sorry, just um, sort of changing the subject slightly, I, uh, because we were we were um, earlier we were talking about uh, what category of individuals within organisations are the ones that could most usefully uh, be targeted from a marketing perspective. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is um, I'm wondering whether um, we couldn't put more effort um, in targeting the, the the risk and compliance community um, in general, and I'll just put um, a link in the chat here. Um, so this is a, a sort of um, a magazine which um, comes through to me on a sort of fairly regular basis. And um, so it, it talks about, you know, a broad range um, of, of um, risk and so some financial risk, things like sort of, you know, failing to comply with sanctions, how to deal with um, reputational risk. There's obviously quite a lot of um, discussion in here about uh, how insurance companies deal with and handle risk as well. Um, and they talk about cybersecurity risk as well. So um, clearly, there's some sort of you know direct uh, connection um, with the, uh, uh, the 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 the, the um, security um, and vulnerability compliance work uh, that we're doing with Open Chain. Um, but there's a lot of um, uh, uh, 
activities like um, seminars, webinars, um, and um, and so on, both online and offline in the risk and, and compliance world. Um, and I just wondered if we maybe ought to zoom out a little little bit and think about this, um, you know, less in terms um, of a, a sort of tech related activity um, and possibly something that is a, something that should be considered as part of any organization's uh, general risk and compliance portfolio. Um, and certainly this is something that I've been talking to financial services companies about in the context of um, the risk management, general operational risk. And, um, you know, uh, clearly, um, I mean, that's a requirement under specific legislation like MIFID, for example, that you re review your general operational risk to make sure that you're not putting your um, financial services clients at risk because, for example, you can no longer operate a particular piece of software because, you know, maybe it's not compliant and you've had an injunction that stops you from using it and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I wonder um, if, um, you know, we should take a, a step back uh, and maybe maybe think about um, targeting the more general risk and compliance community, because there are people sitting within organizations whose job it is to, you know, manage risk and compliance throughout the organization. And where that tends to operate is that a particular piece of legislation comes in and then they they react to that legislation, whether it's GDPR or whether it's MIFID or, um, you know, what, whatever else it, it, it happens to be. Um, maybe we should be more proactive in that field and uh, market, um, you know, through uh, uh, magazines like this, through through the sort of events that that um, uh, the, these 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 sort of people attend. So anyway, just a, just a random thought. Andrew, that, that's great. I think. Uh, are you thinking maybe perhaps like a, maybe an article in a magazine such as this or? Uh... Absolutely, and you know, I think again, this is something that um, you know, if we do get. Um, uh, the, the result of the wider survey um, that, um, you know, we're going to get the results, Shane says we'll get the results to that sooner, but also the, 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 the other survey that I proposed as well. So that's, that's, that's a pretty good, um, you know, starting point, um, whether we could have, um, you know, I mean, uh, I, I target, for example, this particular magazine, I mean, there are plenty of them around, um, but, um, you know, have them interview um, you or Shane or, you know, whoever else wants to be interviewed to understand um, a, a little more about it. Um, I think that's, a, a, you know, be sort of particularly sort of interesting route just to get it onto the radar of the general risk and compliance people and say, so they know this is something that we should be, we should be thinking about, you know, if XYZ goes wrong, it's going to have a serious effect on our company, our ability, our ability to service our clients and so on um clearly open source compliance is uh, you know potentially a big problem there and um you know we with with um uh, and, and also on on the uh, the vulnerability side of things as well i mean there's a few more poster children for that um through you know heartbleed etc um but uh, you know this is all this is also directly relevant to our message i think absolutely no 100 percent concur um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that in some ways we are getting diminishing returns from just speaking to the, the normal open source audience. Um, and perhaps that's because quite a few of the people involved in open source, let's say, administrative management or strategy aren't necessarily dealing with the, the risk center and they're not necessarily doing the procurement contracts. So going to speak to those people would seem to be the natural next step to accelerate what we're up to. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I'm just taking a note of what Martin said here. Uh, tech tech transfer other offices. Interesting. Inroad there into, yeah. And I think as Ria said, like what, you know, we should coordinate this along with the, the path to performance as well. I think, you know, Let's let's get, gain, you know gain awareness, but direct people right into that path, right? And let's get them right on the path, uh, and make that as smooth as possible, right? Getting people through to the information they need, um, you know, and I it will reduce the I guess apprehension you know people have when they come finally to the spec, right? Uh, that by the time you get to the spec, I think things in there are well understood. Uh, that should be our goal. So. Yeah, Martin made a point that the earlier a company starts, the less pain. And this, this sort of swings us right back to the North America thing, where companies might have bespoke processes in place and are reluctant to shift to an international standard unless it's absolutely imperative. Um, 
which is still a speculative reason for the, the traction being lesser in North America than elsewhere. But uh, yeah. yeah. By the way, I've got a side note. Um, speaking of kind of community growth and outreach, uh, on this call, we've got, I believe, our first South African participant, Lufuno, who's right here and has been very active in the Q&A. So, you know, we are organically spreading across the world. Uh, and I think Lufuno is the first person we've got um, actively working on how Open Chain will integrate with things like government policy in the African continent. So it'll be great to have a foothold in South Africa. So welcome here. Thank you. You know, Shane, I wonder if we should address the last question um, from your, your deck, um, you know, while we have our participants here. All righty. Yep, I think that's the one we probably haven't reached too much. Um, yeah, it, so how should this community work? And it may, I, maybe Shane, I should let you start with this one. Um, okay, um, so we have uh, essentially two areas where we've been developing material to talk to people about open chain. Um, and one area has been through our onboarding uh, work group. Um, and another has been through our education work group. Um, because our project charter has a provision for a more formal onboarding committee, um, and because there is overlap between the onboarding work group and the education work group, it seems pretty timely for us to formally convene the onboarding committee to do formal strategy discussions and votes and do our operational activity under the banner of education. So it's, it's something I think we can organize ourselves here uh, in, in doing in the future. Um, and, and one reason I suggest that is related to combining our resources. So the few people in onboarding who aren't in education and vice versa end up just working more closely together. Another reason I suggest it is because we're now, what, seven years into open chain, and we have to think very strongly about continuity. Um, and, and also, uh, I suppose, um, provenance. So it'll be useful when we are doing these calls, we have our notes, um, then eventually it feeds into say a qu quarterly meeting, which has a formal vote about, yes, this is where we're going. Um, and, and we execute through the work groups. And just to make sure that people coming completely outside uh, can easily get their footing on how we came up with stuff. Um, and, and that's just a note about what we're doing here today. Um, but I think it can play into the, the third point we had, which was how do we do great community support um, and making it as consistent as possible and as understandable as possible. Um, and the material, but also the power structures and decision-making, I think will, will play a part in, in helping spread things. Um, moving into that, by the way, this is a side note. This will give us the opportunity also to do something new for open chain, which has to become part of the fabric of open chain itself. Uh, with years in for our various work groups and so on, we probably need to introduce a methodology elections to rotate chairs out of various work groups uh, so that people can retire and new people can step forward. So I think that this will be an opportunity for onboarding and education to perhaps innovate by having the first chair rotations, uh, which will also see us doing the same uh, across other work groups in the future. Again, making sure that we have continuity, making sure that it's easy to understand how the structures work and making sure everyone can participate. Uh, Nathan, do you have any thoughts on that? And I, I think, you know, Balakrishna has mentioned in the education work group that he wants to see a chair rotation in education. Um, so, you know, I, I think that if I may, it might be useful, Nathan, to uh, have some of your leadership here as we do some rotation for education and perhaps under the onboarding committee uh, to help give oversight and to explain that to people. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to take the first round here and, um, and uh, excited about the opportunities we have right now. Um, but I, I think, uh, and maybe Shane, I think based on our last discussion, it sounded like we'll, we'll take this as the 
venue to to um, talk about strategy. What you know, what are the most important points to to push for, right? And I think in the education work group is where we'll we'll I guess submit the work. Um, is that kind of the or or collaborate? Uh, no, I think that would be great. If we did that, it would be great. Yeah. Uh, so we would actually do our work under education um, and we'd sort of have a, maybe a quarterly meeting to have votes and so on uh, to just leave a record of the strategic decision we made and any justification necessary. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds great. And so I think out of this, we'll produce our first you know, set of points about what, what you know, people are, I think we should aim, aim toward um, in, in our priorities. And then that will translate into, um, you know, action taken not only by, by me and in, in this group, but also projects for the, the education work group as well. Yep. And, and so, uh, Sorry, go ahead. No, apologies. I just realized I've, I've been watching the chat more closely than the Q&A, so I was trying to make sure I didn't miss any. <laughs> uh, it's actually been busy. We've had a lot of contributions. Uh, so that's, yeah. that's good. Uh, yeah. No, I, I think you, you're exactly right. And um, that's sort of what we need to do. And uh, speaking of the chat, I noticed that Martin wants us to buy him beer. Yep, OK. Uh, <laughs> next time we're face to face, it's uh, it's already arranged. Ria, you you have your hand up. Over to you. Well, I missed the conversation about getting beers, but you know I went in on that too. <laughs> so <laughs> that sounds good. But uh, in terms of marketing, which is probably more relevant to this discussion, I was curious because I know Open SSF is very heavily involved in government discussions related to the executive SBOM order and so forth, um, where I could see Open Chain having some play would be maybe with the GSA that deals with government procurement. And they're all very interrelated matrix organizations since it's all the US government and it's all kind of leading toward that executive SBOM, but maybe working with GSA would be an area if you're not already doing that, at least in the US. I'm sure there's others. Uh, I'm not familiar with that other countries and uh, what their version of the GSA is, but that no, may be some place to get some further traction. Uh, no, that's absolutely a, a very good point. Uh, so I think that would be really useful. Um, we have been talking with NTIA around the SBOM stuff and so on, uh, but the GSA would be good. Uh, do you have a, a contact we might reach out to there to get the ball rolling? I'm afraid I don't. I'm just familiar <laughs> that the organization exists, but it seemed like it would be a good match for Open Chain and what Open Chain is trying to accomplish. Absolutely. But maybe you could reach out to, um, is, it, is his name Alan Friedman? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's with, he, he does stuff with NTIA as well. Yeah. Yeah, I know he's, he's really, I think he's with CISA, isn't he? I believe so. So he probably has contacts at GSA. Okay, I'll reach out to Alan and, and see what we can get doing. That's a, a very good point. Yeah, no, I like that. That could be our avenue to building more traction in the United States. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm guessing the GSA would be quite amenable to an ISO standard to solve for this problem. Right. And I think that's a great idea as well. So I think that's, um, you know, any type of driver like that, right? Where, where, you know, that seems like a very efficient place to target, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, if if we if we assume that perhaps our our strategic geopolitical weakness right now is traction in North America, it might be good to put some emphasis there. Uh, this isn't to say that we don't need to do a, a lot elsewhere, um, but perhaps it would be nice to give an extra push in North America to see if we can uh, make sure people are 
actually using the ISO standard uh, rather than doing bespoke stuff. Yeah, and maybe some of these things can be keywords, right? Like if you're if you're finding you're under a requirement for, you know, any given list, right? Right. Um, you know, then that that's our lead into okay. Well, here's here's your path to your, um, you know, your, your your best approach, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah. My goodness, we have a lot of action items, Nathan. That's what we do. <laughs> so, this That's why you have a mini summit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To get yeah. more work to do. That's right. I'm not even sure how big our to-do list is, but it's, it's not insubstantial. <laughs> I'll make another comment. I've been playing around on the website, which is honestly kind of this session has been sort of my first time really delving into the website. And it feels a little bit kludgy going from the page where you do the open chain self-certification at certification.openchainproject.org. Right. And I look at that page and I say, I can get more details about self-certification. There's a link. So I go to that link and that takes me to this page that is get started conformance. So it says, use our free web app. That takes me back to the page where I was just at. And I did that a couple of times trying to figure out where's the free app. And then I realized I probably need to sign in first. So I then I started the sign in process and the sign in process has at the bottom of it, my name and email may be shared on the conformance page of the open chain website, which I'm not sure I'm ready to commit to yet since I haven't actually done. I mean, I've looked at the questionnaire and, you know, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll take a look at this, but committing to things up, agreeing to the Linux Foundation in terms of use and privacy policy, that's easy. But um, agreeing to put my name and email on a website, I'm maybe not ready to do that just yet. So I don't know if there's a reason that you want that up front, or if maybe that could be put something put at the end. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I, I think Pledgy is a great way to describe our current self-certification questionnaire situation. Um, we, we need to redo the web app and we need to redo the path. Uh, I, I think that we'll, what you will see when we redo the web app is it will just be fully integrated into the website as a questionnaire. And the purpose of asking about having the email on the website is after a person submits their certification, uh, we had had previously utilized a list, which is still available through the web app showing the company and the rep who submitted it. Um, and nowadays on the main website, we just show the logo, but it is kludgy, it's legacy stuff. And um, I, I concur, we, we just need to fix it as soon as possible. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention on showing the logo of the company. So, I mean, that gets into trademark issues. And I know that we just joined the SPDX uh, membership roster. And, you know, that took me, you know, several months of going back and forth between the legal department and getting Linux Foundation to sign off on our trademark policy and everything else, which, I mean, everything was very easy and there was nothing difficult about the, the language of it, but it was just a process of coordinating the right people. So I can't simply just sign up for somebody and say, right. yeah, use our logo. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, in the um, in the web app, it should give an option not to allow it. And and just that's one of the things that it, it is a pertinent point because the announced programs announced via our website are listed here. But that's only the companies that decided to a use our web app and b allow us to announce it on our website. So um, yeah. It, the amount of companies using Open Chain versus the amount of companies on the website are two different things. Yeah, these are, yeah, these have been fantastic points. Um, yeah, and uh, work is definitely needed here. So, oh yeah, <laughs> we have the um, all of the benefits and the disadvantages of having quite a few years of traction and activity. Um, and certainly we're in the middle of doing things like trying to dramatically improve the website 
And I think the web app is probably the number one priority to just get completely redone um, as soon as possible. So uh, the PM was tasked today with going and finding uh, developers for us. So this should be something that I'll have good news for you uh, very soon. Yeah, that's great news, Shane. Um, finally, I think Santosh had a, had a comment. Um, look at similar solutions being offered. I wonder if this, is, if this seems a little similar to what Andrew had raised as well. Um, uh, so maybe along with the partners, we can look for people providing kind of ancillary or, or similar type of services, right? Maybe related to, to security. So maybe that's another aspect similar to what Andrew raised that, that we can reach communities who are doing things in, in uh, you know, areas we can certainly be helpful in. Um, like security audits, things like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're at the one hour 30 mark, so I think we might need to wrap it up there. Uh, we, we're going to have a recording of this, and I know Nathan took some notes as well. Uh, so I, I guess, Nathan, shall we swing back to everyone in the next week or so and get this uh, show on the road? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, Shane, I'll, I'll write to you. We'll see if we can get a time to just chat quickly and then I'll, I'll send you some notes. So, absolutely brilliant. Awesome. Yeah, so, so thank you for everyone's feedback. This is a. a... <laughs> yeah. This. Yeah. Uh, and Nathan, thank you very much for sharing this. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And it's great to have us re-energized on onboarding and education. Let's uh, let's take all of these points and action them as soon as possible <laughs> to make everything work as well as possible for people. Absolutely. Well, everyone, take care, be safe, be well, and talk with you super soon. All right, thank you all. <laughs>